ladies and gentlemen and everything in between possibly you know um welcome back to the anatomy podcast it is currently 1106 a.m for me on the 15th of june um it has been about a week since we did our last podcast session with the entirety of a pretext to human suffering and their new album their debut full-length record endless cycle of suffering is now out independently and otherwise with physical merch options as well through reality fade records which is a fantastic record label and a fantastic organization for they are also associated with other buddies of ours including shrine of malice and vile impregnation but welcome to another anatomy podcast or anatomy crosscast um session as we are changing the name and trying to make that minor adjustment that way when you're searching for it on spotify um you will not run into an actual podcast for lobotomies and other things i haven't really listened to any of the sessions but you know that's the first anatomy (laughs) podcast that comes up is probably talking about uh accidents in the hospital or some shit accidents in the lab but um today is a pretty awesome day um, after only one delay, so I'm, I'm getting pretty good at that. <laughs> um, we are talking with James of Draconian Rain. Um, this is a newer, I would say, Black and Deathcore um, album. Sit- cool. Slow down the brain a little bit. This is a newer Black and Deathcore band that is making a rise in the scene. Um, they joined Seek and Strike recently, which is the same label, more or less, as our buddies over in Croesus. And um, this is an awesome band. I actually just listened to the Tragedy Eternal EP. And though I don't remember seeing the Black and Death Core label just being smacked on there, you know, the millions of hashtags associated with Lorna Shore, Worm Shepherd, Nithful. Um, though I don't remember seeing any of those, just listening to the EP Tragedy Eternal, which we will be talking about with due time, um, I definitely had all the check marks on the list as far as, yeah, this is like pretty evil. There's the or- orchestral <laughs> elements. There's the male choir in the background. There's the darker imagery. There's the logo with either a castle, a gate, or some t- like ravens or even bats on top of the logo. Um, Looks very metallic, utilizes old English font, but warps it just enough to where you're like, oh, that's kind of old English, but not, you know, all of the check marks that are required to make a band kind of fit into that growing, booming subgenre in the metal scene. Again, with bands like Lorna Shore, Awaken Providence, Warm Shepherd, Nithful, The Breathing Process, and the list goes on. Speaking of that, we have a playlist on Spotify that I update regularly including um tragedy eternal which i just uploaded to it today um that is everything in black and death core and death metal that i feel is relevant and groundbreaking per se to the genre and you better bet your ass that i added tragedy eternal to that playlist until for example james says uh we can go ahead and take that off but add it to another one of your playlists or something like that (laughs) Um, so today as i said we are talking with james this is the vocalist of tragedy eternal so we got a little bit of frontman syndrome going on today but not intentionally um and we're going to be talking with him we're going to be learning his story and then we're going to be taking a little bit of his time to provide all listeners to draconian rain and let's go ahead and check the listener count while we're at it the following um the 6423 of you monthly listeners on spotify um we will providing be providing you all some lyrical insight onto this debut four piece EP. After all, usually an EP is a sampler and that means, you know, something bigger is on the horizon. You know, it hasn't become dawn yet. The sun isn't rising just yet. Maybe it's a, maybe it's midnight. So you got about like four hours and um, in the music industry, four hours being like, you know, another year or at least another half year before the next thing comes in. But this is a sampler. And I got to say, it's a pretty good snack as we're waiting for the main course that Draconian Rain plans to provide in the future um, as it continues its discography. But for starters, as we kind of warm up and get comfortable in session, this is, you know, more or less our first time officially talking face to face. So lovely to meet you. Lovely to have you on the podcast. Absolutely love the tattoos. I love the hair, love the beard. Like you got a whole bunch of stuff going on. It looks great. And um, it looks great for the podcast. So thank you for presenting a pretty good first impression for the podcast. Um, as we hope in the future, 
to go ahead and bring the entirety of Draconian Reign on the podcast. That'd be pretty sick. But of course, more or less, this is like the first date with Draconian Reign on the Anatomy Crosscast. So for starters, man, how are you doing today? I'm really good. Good, good. I'm glad to hear. And if I remember correctly, because of the the time difference between here in the United States versus Greenwick, um, it is uh, now currently 6 or 7 p.m. for you, correct? Oh, we seem it to have is connection issue. 11 past 7 in the Fantastic. And I definitely do not plan to take much of your time because, I mean, most human beings, they, they are preparing to at least get ready to uh, uh, sleep or, you know, kind of like depart into the spiritual world, per se, um, going getting into all that REM and DMT and stuff. Not the actual concentrated drug, just the brain chemical disclaimer, people. Um, but yeah, I definitely do not plan to take much of your time. Um, but I did want to let you know ahead of time that we do seem to have a big jump in, uh, in time. There's a massive delay on my end. So hopefully, um, that will figure itself out as we progress into session that way. Um, you know, there isn't a big gap of space and massive moments of silence, but there's also editing people cause I'm getting into that. Um, so Getting started right off the bat, again, thank you for deciding to take some time to jump onto the Anatomy Crosscast, tell your story, talk all things you feel is relevant to you and the connection between um, you and Dr Draconian Rain. Um, for starters, though, definitely want to get in touch with your more like personal side of the story, learn everything we can about you. Um, so you may take as much time as you want, sir, and go ahead and just kind of Tell us who you are. Tell us what you do for the band, and uh, we'll go ahead and proceed from there. Kind of like elementary school level right now. <laughs> Show and tell. That's what we call it here. Yeah. Um, so I'm James. I am the vocalist um, of Draconian Rain. So we sort of started in lockdown. <clears throat> we sort of had an idea of a band before COVID lockdown. And then whilst we didn't really have anything to do, James, uh, the other James of the band, who's the guitarist, and I, started writing sort of rough songs. Uh, we didn't really know if we were ever going to be a proper band or just um, a sort of studio project, um, an online project. Uh, so we didn't really have an idea of where we wanted to go. So we actually released an EP last year called Necromantic. Okay. Which was quite... Um, it wasn't particularly focused because we weren't really sure what sort of band we wanted to be. And then with Tragedy Eternal, which came out this year, we really had a... Um, an idea of what we wanted to sound like, an idea of, of who we wanted to be um, and who we wanted to rip off. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, dude, after all, too, like keeping that in mind, how many bands are there today? You know what I mean? Like you can't really answer that question because there are so many. So eventually, you know, no matter what you're doing, um, someone will say that you're ripping off this band, you're ripping off this band because of a certain riff. Like, dude, the yeah. fucking the 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 um the debates. Um, I think one of the biggest ones back in 2018, which is quite a bit of time ago now, five years ago. But I remember if you're I don't know if you listen to either Architects or Wage War, or if you like participate in the metalcore subgenre. Um, but basically Architects had a song called Doomsday that they released back in 2018. And then I think uh, I correct myself because it was during Wage War's uh, Manic cycle, uh, Manic, um, their latest record that they released back in 21. Um, they had a song called Low that utilized and compressed. Uh, um, OK, uh, la, la, la. OK, I'm back for now. I'm back for now. <laughs> it's weird, very strange, this mic. Um, but they had a song called Low wage war did that they wrote back in uh, 2021 or 2020 something like that during their manic cycle and people often compared it to uh, architects in their 2018 song doomsday the one that really kick-started the holy hell album cycle so ultimately you have this issue to where there are so many bands so many subgenres, so many artists that eventually because people you know, they're, they're fans, they're participants, but they're not the actual musicians. 
perhaps there is a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of tribute to these other artists when you're in the studio, when you're writing stuff. But ultimately, you know, eventually you'll be compared to someone. That's that's the overall message that I was trying to relay and just trying to get back to you. Because, yeah. I mean, without a doubt, there's so much music that you can't really not copy anybody else, whether intentionally or non-intentionally. It's just the fact of adding your own spice to it or maybe even adding like, hey, I'm not Will Ramos. Do you see my bleach white hair and my beard? Does he have bleach white hair and a beard? I don't think so. I'm not Will Ramos, but we definitely inspired him. That type of thing. More casual conversation. And half the time, man, as far as I'm concerned, circumstances like that, that means that you're um you're in touch with the music you're in touch with the modern music scene and of course there are plenty of musicians and artists that i know that prefer not to um they prefer to divert and stay away from the scene right for whatever reason possible but mostly for creative pollution that way they don't get like lorna shores into the hellfire to the hellfire mixed in with their song um but you know it just happens it happens like that but anyways i didn't mean to uh interject no, no, we were the same. So, like, we really like Lauren Shaw. They're a great band, obviously. But, like, we were... It's funny. So we came out a little bit later, but, you know, our first EP we wrote just before To The Hellfire came out, obviously, that right. blew up. We were fans of the band from the Tom Barber era, so the Funeral Coffin era. But, uh, you know, we, we're really inspired by bands like Dimmy Borgir and Cradle of Filth and Septic Flesh oh. and Effects. So... We're probably inspired by the same bands as a lot of these quote unquote black and death core bands are, but we don't listen to black and death core per se and say, oh, we need to sound like that. Right. I think it's more the sense of like, we probably listen to the same bands that these guys do. And we came out at quite a similar time. So we've been lumped in with them, which is completely fair as, as a music consumer. You're going to, you know, lump similar bands in with each other so that you can, uh, you know, organize your library essentially. Exactly. But we, we were never like, oh, we need to sound like Black and Death Call is happening right now. We should jump on this wave. It was more the sense <laughs> of, you know, I've been into black metal since forever. Uh, you know, so I'm 30 years old. I got into black metal when I was about 15 with bands like Dark Funeral and then the symphonic stuff like Dimu and, you know, um, septic flesh and flesh god apocalypse etc like that shit was really cool to me because i really grew up like loving the lord of the rings so i really got into sort of yeah film scores and stuff and and, and, and james our guitarist is into uh, he plays like dark souls and bloodborne epic and dark atmosphere we yeah. wanted to add to the sort of 2010 era deathcore not the myspace stuff but like the 2010 era stuff Mm -hmm. And then it sort of just so happened that, you know, I use primarily high screams, but I'm much more influenced by, you know, Trevor from the Black Jolly Murder than I am from contemporary deathcore. Because I'm probably older than these lads. Like, you yeah. know, obviously the bands are popping, which is fucking sick for them. But like, I've been into extreme metal for a long time. So it, it was more just a coincidence that we yeah. sound like that. Yeah, Although and... these ones are all fucking sick. Like, yeah. it's fucking sick what they're doing. So, you know... If we're being compared to these bands, it's not a bad thing because they're no. already fucking good as well. Exactly. And that's the thing, too, is like approaching it from a more positive perspective, because if you get mad at people for comparing you to bands or if people are like um, in a frustrated manner comparing you to other bands, it's like, I don't know, it just creates unnecessary negative uh, tension and negative atmosphere. And then you're like, we're not fucking yeah. Lorna Shore. Leave me alone. Like, they're like, oh, sorry. You know, I thought it was actually pretty yeah. cool. And then you're like, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Like, <laughs> I just don't read comments on like YouTube or anything like that. Just because I'm like, right. even if it's good, that's cool to see. But if it's bad, I don't want to see it. You know, right. like, you know. So I really don't listen to Deathcore very much. So like... I got into extreme metal through metal core such as Party Drive and Architects in like 2007, 2008. Obviously, Bring the Horizon, they're from an hour up the road. So in their death court era, they were a big deal to me. I wanted to come with Suicide Silence and Whitechapel and shit like that. Like, you know, I fucking love death core. But these days, I really just listen to hip hop. Uh, I listen to UK rap a lot. Hello? Yeah. Um, and I listen to black metal and, you know, some death metal. But... I read. I think it's because now I'm in a deathcore band. If I listen to deathcore, I'll end up being like, "Fuck, maybe we should have done this." Or yeah, you know, I really like Chelsea Grin and Darko. They're yes. the deathcore bands I really like. So yes. Darko and Chelsea Grin, their new stuff, I really fuck with. 
Yeah. But as it, opposed to symphonic or black and death core, it's not something I particularly listen to. Um, mm. I really liked the Lawn Shaw Immortal album. Yes. Like that album was really fucking cool. Like I really like that. Right. And like they're really good now, but uh, I think it's more that now we're making music. I just don't listen to it as much in case I end up, you know, thinking, oh, maybe we should do this or that, you know. Um, if anything, more or less, um, with the first half, we like want to learn as much as, about you as possible, as much about your story as possible. So, I mean, we we're now like learning a little bit more. How about um, you got into Draconian Rain? The fact that, you know, Tragedy Eternal was not your first EP as a project. I totally spaced that part off because I forgot about the Necromantic EP. So now I got to do that. Now I got to do a front to back session for that and truly do my homework on the band. Um, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that before the pandemic and stuff, you had a different project in mind other than Draconian Rain, like more metalcore, or was it the same thing just renamed? Yeah. So, um, James, the guitarist of Draconian Rain, we were originally in a sort of deathcore band in like 2010, 2011. So this was, I say deathcore, we were like a, a Black Dolly Murder ripoff band. Right. Um, but we were quite good. Um, and, you know, we did quite a lot of shows and stuff. And then we sort of disbanded. We sort of, we were still really good friends. Like we lived together and shit. But, um, and then we, we just went out one night and we were just drinking and stuff. And we were like, oh, maybe we should just write some riffs for fun. Yeah. So we just decided to like get together, have a few beers, and like write some sort of, it was like melodic death metal in the vein of Black Dolly Murder and Arsis and, okay. you know, um, the Arsis era, like melodic tech death bands. Yeah. And then, um, then we ended up writing a bit of death core here and there. And, you know, we sort of sat on it for a bit. And then during the pandemic, was when we were really like, okay, we could start a band. Like, we should start a band, you know. Um, we'll, we'll find members later, just me and you. Then we were lucky enough to find some really talented musicians uh, from our hometown uh, who who could actually play the shit that we were writing. Uh, and now, like, there are fucking boys who fucking love them to death. And that includes Callum, our guitarist, who isn't James, was also in our old band. And then our drummer, Kelsey, and our bassist, Andy, are in a metalcore band called The 500. Okay. Uh, they're a really cool band. It's not really my sort of music, but they're really good at what they do. Yeah. But they were already a sort of unit together. They already had a van. They already had a practice room. Right. You know, they've got um, a digital setup. They all played to click already. So it was really seamless transition to becoming our own unit. Yeah, exactly. And I dare have to ask, too, concerning Draconian Rain, should we expect the more like melodic death metal elements to make it into future draconian rain material? Ooh, I don't know. So um, we've got lots of ideas and riffs at the moment for right. the album. Uh, so we haven't really gone into it saying we should do this or we should do that. Right. Personally, I'd like to do something a little bit different. As you've mentioned um, you know, there are lots of bands in the same sort of umbrella of the symphonic or black and death core, however you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So personally, I'd like to step away from that a little bit. Um, you know, it might end up being much more death metal. Um, you know, we're all into death metal as well. It might end up with metal core parts. It might end up with black metal parts. We, yeah. we haven't really set expectations yet. We're just going to try and get in a room and try and write what we want to listen to and what we exactly want yeah because the thing is when it comes to actually writing music like of course you can have the original intention to confine yourself to a subgenre but like even that sentence itself it makes most musicians uncomfortable and it should mm -hmm. because then you are feeding into like certain um genre radical like even fashion stereotypes or something like okay boys are we gonna wear street wear for the photo shoot are we gonna look more like hip-hop artists that type of shit and you see this massive transition of even Lorna Shore admitting that, yeah, of course, we our foundation, our legacy has been built upon the idea of deathcore or even black and deathcore, symphonic deathcore. But you got bands like Lorna Shore and Shadow of Intent who are more leaning into um, like death metal or symphonic death metal, black and death metal with every now and then some like really, really balanced out, but like heavier parts. Because that's mm -hmm. the key to making good music, I think. Um, Jonathan Davis of Korn says it best, and that's why 
despite their most recent album, they're one of my um, my top prevailing artists over time. I mean, for most kids uh, my age and stuff, Corn was a big thing back in the day and back in junior high and high school. And then you had the kids who had the opportunity to listen to uh, Life is Peachy or Follow the Leader back in the late 90s, early 2000s that really, really have been there since the beginning. But the way he said it best was you have to have balance. And that's what Corn does. Like they have their spooky elements, they have their really raw emotional moments, but most importantly, they don't ever do a song where it's completely just like ooh, like the whole fucking song. Like you mm-hmm. have moments where you can take a break, you have balance, and I think that's really key to making good music, especially in the heavier world. Um, and of course, you have like these massive, massive worlds worth of people um, that are just like no heavy all the time, cleans their shit, blah blah blah. I'm like. Like, I don't care about any of that because all life is, is about balance. Like you have to have a balance between day and night, darkness and light, good and evil. Even if those are mainly like human constructs and stuff in a matter of perspective, like neither way you have to have balance in the world. You have to have balance in the creative medium that you're providing to your people. Otherwise it's overwhelming in a negative or positive aspect. And they're less likely to want to participate in that. Unless of course, you know, all heavies, no cleans, you know, of course that's, that's, that's besides the point. I'm putting that on the sidelines. I'm putting that over in the bleachers and we're in the freaking football field. You got to have balance in your creative mediums any time of the day, period. But yeah, awesome and more like definitely organic discussion that we're having. And it's it's always fun to like just talk as if we're in the same room, um, despite yeah. the fact that we're a whole entire body of water apart. It's always fun to do that. Um, Where in the and, States are you? What's up? Where in the States are you? I am in Arizona. Okay, cool. Yeah, the hottest, like the second hottest fucking state in the, <laughs> in the country. One, two. Um, basically the new California because all the folks from California are coming over here with their droughts and their housing markets just plummeting or I guess I should say they're skyrocketing um but the the uh the um the value and the equity and stuff like that the the actual value of homes and stuff is just climbing to the floor because no one wants to live there anymore and if they do well good luck <laughs> um but yeah, definitely Arizona, born and raised here, was over in Tennessee for a little bit and then came back and, you know, I regret it for the most part, but also I have a pretty awesome opportunity and opportunity now that's a little bit more consistent. I won't be having to move for the next couple of years. So I'm nice and comfortable and we're getting stationary. So that's always fun. Um, nice. Yes, sir. And um, let's see, as we're like continuing to learn a bit about you, I guess th- one of the most basic questions I can ask any vocalist, right? Because I don't know if you've dabbled in uh, instrumental efforts and stuff, if you've done like guitar or drums over time, maybe even a little music theory and piano in school. Um, but like, yeah, what ended up getting you into uh, what ended up getting you into becoming a vocalist and like wanting to be in a band? Oh, right. This is a really fucking easy question. So uh, how old are you? Are you my age? Uh, 23. You're 23, so you're you're a young lad to me. I'm 30 years old. So uh, yeah, so we I was 15 in 2008. So I just saw a photo of Oli Sykes from Bring the Horizon, right? And I just I was like, that's who I want to be. That's yeah, and that's pretty. Yeah. That, it it must be cool too, because you mentioned earlier that you that you and the boys, or at least you, are like an hour down the street from um, the lads yeah, in Bring so- the Horizon. I think the drummer is from Rotherham. So there's a town next to Sheffield called Rotherham. Mm. I think the from Rotherham. They filmed the video for the Come Down in Rotherham. And that's where my family's from. Okay. So they were like fucking local legends to me, even though I'm in Nottingham. So we're like an hour away from Sheffield. But with family from South Yorkshire, like they were like the fucking local legends. And they're a completely different genre of music. But Arctic Monkeys, they're also from Sheffield and Rotherham. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, so like that was like the sort of local mecca of of, of music, you know. Um, and then obviously I saw Mitch Locker, I saw Phil Bozeman. And right. It's, it's like fuck yeah, that's just one. And I'm like, look at me now, I'm still fucking bought into <laughs> all that shit. So yeah. like, yeah, that's all I wanted to be, pretty much. So I heard Black Dolly Murder Nocturnal uh, when I was sixteen, so in two thousand nine, and then just after I heard that, Deflorate by the black tire motor came out and i was like fuck i just need to sound like this because you know the high screams of ollie mitch look uh trevor sternard um 
I just wanted to sound like that. So right. that's why our music is primarily highs. I can do other sorts of vocals as well that I don't really do in our band. Like we've got the odd gut roll and stuff, uh, very rarely. But I, you know, I could do like the slam vocals as well. But like I also I'm I'm really 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 into hip hop and like I like I like I freestyle and can rap a bit and shit. Like oh, that. dude, hell yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so so like I really don't dress like how I do in Draconian Vein at all. Like uh, you know. I'm much more of a hip hop head than I am a metal head. Uh, though, you know, like I used to have really long hair and want to be metal and like wear like fucking deicide shirts and suffocation shirts, and, <laughs> you know, want to be metal. And then like I got to a point where I was like, no, I'm just going to be who I fucking want to be. Like, exactly, dude. And that that's yeah. the important thing, too, is um especially back in the day in the early 2000s the 2010s the 90s the 80s like if you were metalhead you had to wear metal shirts otherwise you'd be a fucking poser or like you know you got people like kim kardashian or kanye west um which not my favorite people in the world but you know every now and then you'll see them wearing like a a slayer shirt or a cannibal corp shirt and there's very specific people who are like fuck you you're a poser you don't even listen to metal get the fuck out of here whatever um and uh, every now and then I yeah, think I think it's great, great. promotion for the genre. Exactly. Like anything it can... that makes metal cool to kids that don't know about metal is a fucking win. Like right. you know, uh one of the Kardashians wearing a cannibal corp shirt, like who gives a fuck? Like if someone sees that and goes, What the fuck is cannibal corps? Like, there's so many streetwear brands now in the UK that have the death core, death metal, black metal style logos now, like that's fashion now. Yep. So and that now that that's fashionable, people might, you know, give people who wear metal shirts less shit when they're kids. So it'll make people who want to be into metal but might be scared of what people think more more freedom to be like, fuck it, I listen to fucking extreme metal. Yeah. And like the more people, the more open it is as well. You can have kids who like are into pop punk or whatever. They can go to metal shows without the whole click mentality. Yeah. Like when I first started going to deathcore shows, like I only knew Suicide Silence. So I'd be wearing my Suicide Silence shirt and I'd go to a Acacia Strange show, or Despised Icon show, whatever. Right. And I'd have my Suicide Silence shirt on. And people are like, what? You're wearing a fucking Suicide Silence shirt? That's fucking beginner shit. You right. Know? And that made me be like, oh, okay, uh, fucking, I guess I'm not welcome here, you know? Right. And that's that's the worst feeling in the world is when you go to any show ever, which like, thankfully, I've never experienced. I mean, dude, hell, my first concert was Breathe Carolina. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that artist. <laughs> yeah, I fucking know yeah. that. Was, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I went to <laughs> one of their last, I went to their last tour officially. The Sa I think it was the Savages tour when they were still like a band instead of a two-piece DJ thing, which eh, not really into, but you know, whatever. As long as they're comfortable and they feel like creatively free and they feel like this is what we need to do, this is what we should be doing, then good for them. But I definitely have to say they peaked with Savages, but that's my personal opinion. Um, so, yeah, I, that was my first ever show. And I got my ticket signed by the entirety of Brief Carolina on like a paper printout because we didn't really know how to do anything else back then. Um, and I didn't know how to like get ticket stubs or anything like that. I didn't have a phone for a barcode scan as we do today. So yeah. I have, I actually have the physical for my first ever ticket in which it was with like one of my best friends of all time. Shout out to you, Hope. Um, I won't drop the Shout last name. Hope. Shout out Hope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she's, um, she's a great mom now. Proud of her. Um, she's doing a lot for herself. She's in a very stable relationship. She's like, she's climbing up in the world where, well, a single YouTube content creator like me can't. So absolute shout out to her. Dude, proud of her. 23, you're so young. You don't yeah. need to worry about shit. Yeah. But still, still, man, I want to find love, man. I'll find, um, some, find some ladies. Yeah, seriously. I'll come um, out in Arizona. We'll, we'll sort you out. Let's do it. Let's do it, bro. <laughs> come out We'd to come out, man. Yeah, dude. I like, dude, I have quite a couple buddies now over there in the UK, which is like really cool to say. I don't know if you're familiar with a uh, party cannon because you said you're not really a deathcore guy, um, like a deathcore yeah, so metal party guy. Cannon are actually, um, we share the same management company. Oh, there's uh, they're Scottish, aren't they? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've I, so I think, uh, I, I don't think I've ever spoken to them personally, but um, I think one of the members is in a band with one of my friends oh shit 
Yeah, I think in, uh, Iniquitous Savagery. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so I think I've seen them quite a few times because okay. I, I was really into my brutal death metal and slam for a few years as well. Right. With real scene for that in the UK. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's Party Cannon, there's uh, To Obey a Tyrant. That's another buddy of ours, or that's yes. another. We yeah. Played them a few times as well. Right. Yeah, we're buddies with them now. And now I'm trying to be friends with A Night in the Abyss. Um, that's another band over there. Love them. Uh, yeah, she Must our, Burn. They're on our label as well. And She Must Burn. Uh, so A Night in the Abyss and She Must Burn. I haven't ever met them. But um, I think A Night in the Abyss are on our label. And She Must Burn also share our management company with Party Cannon. So oh, shit. The UK is not that big. Like Right, right. We've got, you know, we're all sort of, everyone knows everyone, really. Right. And that's that's always fun, dude. It's like a big old freaking neighborhood. <laughs> it yeah, happens man, to be yeah. a country. Um, yeah. but yeah, a night in the a night in the abyss. I've been trying to get them on the anatomy crosscast forever now. So hopefully I will be soon. Um, I didn't know they were on Seek and Strike. Um, that's actually pretty cool. Unless if yeah. you're talking about something different. Have I let something loose? Maybe. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Why did that out too? Okay. <laughs> they are. I don't think they've released through Seek and Strike yet, so I don't know okay. if that is news. Yeah, all I know is that they were planning to release some new material either this or next month. And um, no, they were planning to back in April. So, I mean, I've been yes. back here in the Valley for a little bit, but they just never released the material. Um, them and uh, another band, there's Monastery. So I'm trying to get them on the podcast. Uh, they're on Seek. Yeah, they're they're fucking sick. I love them. Um, yeah. And then shout there's Suffer. Out. Shout out to, yeah, shout out to the boys. And then uh, there's Suffer UK, which like we tried to get them on the podcast during um, their last major album cycle, uh, but we were just never able to figure out uh, scheduling and stuff. So hopefully we can get them on the podcast here pretty soon because it would be nice to have. Well. What's up? I know those lads as well. So, oh, um... hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. To... Yeah, we might be sorting something, but. Ooh, I'll keep that in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah like, from, I friends. think they're from Wolves or they're from. Birmingham, so they're from an hour away as well. They're from an hour down south from Nottingham, our city. Fuck yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, dude, UK. Like, there are a lot of great bands that have come out of the UK so far. I rem, it's so funny. For the longest time, I thought Ocean's Eight Alaska was from Australia or some shit, and then I've, I'm like, oh, they're from the UK. Interesting. That, that makes a lot more sense. And then you know, yeah. the OG James coming them, back like, last year. Oh, really? Yeah. So like. In like death metal, whatever we've got, like a uh, death core, you know, we've got like Black Tongue and Ingested, Infinite Annihilator. They're like, yes, right. And then in metalcore, we've got Architects and Bring the Horizon. Mm-hmm. They're obviously the big ones. The big, um, yeah, while she sleeps too, for sure. While she sleeps, yeah. And then sort of extreme metal, you know, we've got like Napalm Death, Carcass. Um, who the fuck else? Cradle of Filth. Um, you know. Oh yeah, huh? I forgot they're from the UK. And then if you really want to go back, we've got fucking Jewish priests, Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath. Like, we started this shit. So, yeah. Yeah, fair enough, dude. Yeah, you guys definitely <laughs> started the the metal thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, not too far from the UK. You know, you got bands like Mayhem. You got uh, Flesh God Apocalypse. You got Mental Cruelty, which um, we were planning to have on the podcast recently. They're not as close as you think. No. <laughs> no, not as close. Not as close, but they're like yeah, close they're, enough to be. <laughs> Europe, Europe is fucking popping, man, for sure. Especially with metal. Like I went to Hellfest in France, mm. so that is like the biggest, other than Vacan. Hellfest, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, is like the biggest metal festival in Europe. Um, so I think maybe Vacan Hellfest are on par. Uh, I went there and it was fucking amazing. We took like. 12, 11 years ago but that was fucking sick and we've right. got download festival here that's our big one if you've heard of that no unfortunately not so um this year i think we had bring the horizon metallica slipknot architects evanescence like those like the big names but also we had like lorna shaw behemoth terror yeah. ingested like they all played that's like half an hour away from my house so yeah Damn. Yeah. I love that. We're kind of like descending into a conversation of like talking about all the, like the local heroes and stuff and all yeah, the people yeah, yeah. that I've been, um, I've been trying to get in contact re- recently. Um, 
Just kidding. It's okay. It, it will happen with time. But yeah, plenty of people, plenty of folks over in the UK. And like you said, it's it's more like a um, it's a pretty tight knit community, and it's it's not a big place at all. So it's it's basically just a massive neighborhood that's labeled as a country. Um, yeah. I cannot wait. Like the boys in Party Cannon, that they were actually my first live in person podcast session, and because they happened to have a laptop with them, so we recorded it on their laptop. And during that session, which happens to be episode 20, and it happened in April, something like, hee hee, 420, um, huh. we, uh, we recorded that session behind the venue, the end in downtown Nashville. And during session, we just had like random people, like residents of downtown Nashville walking by. We looked up and there's a dude dressed in a Batman outfit, just like looking down on us from the top of an apartment complex. <laughs> it was fucking weird, Lucky, bro. Yeah. It was great, yeah. though. We were like, oh, my God, dude, Batman? And we're like, oh, my God, yeah, there's Batman up in the window. And he's just looking down. I'm like, what the fuck? But yes. very no, it was great. Very random. But, yeah, it's very fitting for such a podcast session. But um, let's see. So you're, you, you've you been participating in vocals for c- quite a bit of time. You have all of, like, your local heroes. You have all of your vocalists that you look up to. You had um, specific albums, um, one of them being from The Black Dahlia Murder, which is absolutely awesome. And I have yet to really dig into their discography because they're not even kidding. I only haven't listened to all of their albums because all their album covers look exactly the same to me. They're just different colors, you know, because it's like it's gothic scenery, you know. Right. So you need to start with Nocturnal. Okay. And Deflorate. And Miasma. So that's the 2005, 2007, 2009 album. So that was an amazing run. Miasma isn't as well produced as the other bands. It's much more, uh, as the other albums, it's much more raw. Then Nocturnal was the first album where they had a real jump in production. Oh, sure. If you put those, put those three, just put those three into a playlist on their own and just shuffle it. Like, okay. You will fucking fall in love with that band. They are amazing. I, I've seen them about 13 times. Shit. I've got a few Black Dahlia Murder tattoos. My Instagram handle was actually a Black Dahlia Murder lyric. I had the pleasure of meeting Trevor and Brian uh, and Shannon Lucas, their old drummer, and Alan, the latest bassist, uh, like four or five times. And RIP to, to Trevor. Rest in peace, yeah. One of the greatest to ever fucking do it. And without him, there's no way I'd be trying to write the gothic poetry style I'd be doing now. Yeah. Or like, doing the sort of vocal sound. He's biggest inspiration and he inspired bands like from horizon back in the day too on their first album so really one of the greatest to ever do it yeah i agree yeah and i like i just people i just happen to have yet to listen to all these records so now that we have a recommendation now that we have um some albums to listen to that'll be fun to piece together as i continue to kind of like catch up on all the albums that i missed out on because i say this in almost every podcast session now as a disclaimer and plenty of times in um the front the flashback front to back sessions per se but um like i really started in 2012 during the black crown cycle um with the mm-hmm. suicide silence and that was right after bitch pass so i'm like okay i'm listening to this band oh whoa shit the singer just died what how and you yeah. know then i checked out the memorial shows I just fell in love with the the all the major like big shot vocalists coming together to provide um to um fundraise for a college fund for his daughter. I was like, holy shit, this is really cool. Like you would you would think of deathcore death metal vocalist or any artist just being like, no, fuck the world, fuck people. And then you watch the yeah. memorial show, you watch all these just interesting people come together. And then obviously that was also um more or less the the auditions for the next vocalist, Eddie Hermida. And then, you know, they proceeded from there. But I remember, dude, after, I would say it was definitely after that memorial show. And I even have the physical CD for it now because no fucking way I was going to miss out on that. Um, Like, I remember just watching that for the first time. Like, whoa, this is so cool. Just like all these different people coming together. I'm repeating myself. Um, But yeah, yeah. so I I was lucky enough to catch them with, with Mitch twice. Oh, shit. I actually saw them in a really small, uh, it says this place, there's Rock City um, is the venue in Nottingham and there was a, there's a smaller room called The Basement um, and it's probably like 300 capacity and I saw Suicide Silence and Parkway Drive there. Damn. It was fucking insane. God and then damn. I saw them with Behemoth play the main stage in Rock City one year later. Really? So, yeah, damn. That was that, that's, a, that's a major upgrade. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so they went from Wait. like 300 to 3,000 in like a year. 
Yeah, no, that's insane, dude. They they really were able to skyrocket and kind yeah. of take advantage of that like small pocket of time where people are like, "What's Deathcore?" They're like, "For Deathcore," you know, just up in your face and shit. But really good it people prime, behind the scenes. The prime, of, well, maybe not the prime because I was a little bit late. Being thirty, believe it or not, I'm trying to sound young now. I was a little <laughs> bit late, so I got into MySpace like 2007, and then like 2009 was like the last great year for MySpace, and that's right. when Deathcore in my opinion, was skyrocketing. Like, yeah. It was great, especially in the UK. Like, it was fucking crazy. Do you have any uh, MySpace era deathcore bands that you really wish, like, didn't break up or that you oh, wish, yeah. like... Through the Eyes of the Dead. Okay. Fucking amazing. So, Nate Johnson, is that... I think that's his name, was the vocalist of... The second vocalist of Through the Eyes of the Dead. They brought out two albums with him. One was called Malice. One was called Skepsis. Both fucking awesome. And then he went on to join Fit for an Autopsy before uh, Joe. Joe before Joe joined. He was the vocalist until Hellbound. Okay. So he had like that really low voice. They were fucking awesome. I mean, there were loads of really good UK deathcore bands for the Ooh. MySpace here. Uh, there was a band called Emily Rose. They had a sort of viral hit. They had a song where it was like, um, it was called End of Days. And it, it had like a bit that said like, get fucking low or whatever yeah and like, the sort of shit you'd see on the back of t-shirts back in that, that yeah. day um you know obviously annotations of an autopsy they were a big name back then um yeah i mean back then i was really into Vised icon i was into a band called abacab um i was really into a muir uh like really fucking into a muir um you know because i i was like really into black dolly murder and the really metal side of of you know, modern death metal. Then I was into the sort of tough guy side of, of, the, yeah. of the death you know, <laughs> the really side. I really like hardcore as well. You know, I'm really into bands like Death for Dishonor, Terror, you know, uh, Madball. Uh, I'm, I like quite a lot of things. So. Right. No, badass, dude. That's awesome. And most likely I'll have you like send me most of these um music recommendations because there's a lot flooding in. Um, yeah, there's man. always new bands to listen to. Um, and what's what's really cool about the current mechanic behind my channel is, yeah, granted, I have the same amount of videos uploaded now or close to it that I have subscribers. And I'm just hoping that that continues to grow alongside each other, if nothing else. Oh, definitely. But I have a lot to I have a lot to catch up on. So if you want to just do definitely like even spam my main Instagram uh, DMs with just like a whole bunch of different uh, uh, album recommendations, because I, I want to dig into this shit. the reaction shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's doing the reaction stuff. I'll send you fucking loads, man. Hell yeah. I'll fucking send you all the MySpace shit. Let's do it, dude. Let's let's yeah. dig into the MySpace. Yeah, cause... fucking, that's, that, that's the stuff that really got me into metal. And like, I don't know if it's my age, I'm a bit jaded, um, but like, you know, I really just don't have the same passion to find new metal bands as I used to. You right. Know? Now I'm much more wanting to find new rappers. Yeah. Um, so, oh, you know what? While we're talking about that, too, because um, I'm kind of getting into lo-fi hip-hop myself. Uh, definitely the artist that I primarily follow, the super group, is X Society, and they're based here in the U.S. So um, there's Kill Bill, there's Rav, Square, Aerospace. Um, it's like definitely just lo-fi hip-hop, but they also do like really uh, good, I would even say like Biggie Tupac era, like the traditional rapping, not all this like mumble rap business i don't know if you're into that but you know i'm gonna be nice about it if you are um but they're definitely um it's definitely low fi hip-hop it's really good shit but there are definitely plenty of artists that i have been recommended and introduced to that happen to be uk-based uh rappers whether like females um from the channel colors oh yeah, if... yeah 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 so definitely like, also Bill sims and is that one no sims george smith those uh i think so george george smith He's like some, george, george the poet i think george the okay, poet was yeah. one of them yeah so i've been digging into that scene where it counts because like i don't want to just listen to metal but there are definitely certain artists that i'm not into um so like i'm just trying to keep open-minded right like never in my life would i expect at this point in my life you know being as confident and just like yes i love metal i want to make metal i listen to it all the yeah. time as homework and it's never created a pollution thing for me to actually um i'm very comfortable um with the idea of in the future even writing song by song and saying hey this song is for fans of fit for an autopsy you try to bow a silent planet whatever you know 15 <laughs> 15 band lists that way people are like, yeah, oh yeah, I can hear it. I can hear it. 
Um, and hopefully it won't actually just confuse people instead. Um, but when it comes to music of all kinds, like I love listening to uh, Kalandra and Heilung as well because of my um, religious participations, my spiritual beliefs, um, that rooting into like Ossetur, like Norse gods and stuff like that. But by all means, I'm also like uh, um, I associate myself with the satanic temple. So I'm very much atheistic. Right. And I take instead a more like Native American or indigenous approach to deities. And I just recognize them in a- as ancient ancestors instead of gods. Like I don't worship any god. I'm like, hey, all father. Am I doing the right thing? I don't be like, oh, father, dearest and truest, you know, like freaking slit the slit the neck open of a chicken. Just like, OK. Please let the winter be more successful because we don't have to do that these days. We know better. We know that, you know, weather is weather and it's not, you know, because you haven't sacrificed one of your villagers per se (laughs) Um, or, you know, just like they didn't know back then. So I completely understand where they came from. And people are like, oh, my God, Vikings are heathens or savages. I'm like, well, I mean, everybody did stuff, did heinous shit for religion back in the day. But now we know better for the most part. And that's what's important. Um, so, you know, if anything, what are some of your like favorite hip hop artists right now? Because I'm super curious upon that. So um, when I first got into hip hop, it was very much the sort of gangster rap, noughties bling era. So, you know, I was really into 50 Cent and all of G Unit. So like Young Buck, Tony, um, Tony Yeo, Lloyd Banks, The Game. All of like aftermath stuff. So like early Eminem, like his first three albums, Dr. Dre. Um, and then from there I got into Mob Deep, I got into Nas and like the American stuff. And then I got into UK Grime, which was um the sort of prevalent rap music of the UK. Um it wasn't quite hip hop because it was much more from an electronic background. It came from drum and bass and jungle, which are and garage, which are sort of UK. Yeah. Um UK genres, and then, you know, it was stuff like Skepta, Frisco, DW, if you've heard of any of these guys, that are sort of grime. But now there's this whole UK rap, UK drill um, vibe, and, like, there are UK rappers now with 30 million monthly listeners, which was unheard of before. Um, right. You know, so ASAP Rocky, um, he did a collab with Skepta, who's a, a rapper from London in 2018 called Praise the Lord. And that was like the first rap song where the UK and the US were sort of on even footing. Yeah. Okay. And that that's a song of like a billion streams with the UK rapper on it. Fuck yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and now there's a guy called Central C um, and he's, he's like, he makes drill and UK rap, but he's a bit more commercial. I really like him. A lot of my friends aren't into it because it's a bit more commercial. But he's now got like 20 million monthly listeners. Uh, he's just brought out a split EP with another UK rapper called Dave, who's really fucking good. If you if I could recommend any UK rapper for you, it'd be Dave, because he does like the gangster music, the the sort of, you know, the R&B songs about girls and stuff. But he's also got really introspective, like beautiful, deep hip hop songs, you know, good. about his struggles and, and what it's like being working class in the uk or, or being an immigrant yeah in the UK. yeah like so, sometimes you have to have your attila from franz moments just like talking about you know yeah partying and shit Talk but then other shit. times yeah other times it's, it's fun to have a more like authentic lyrical experience and musical experience for your listeners so that's always yeah. great and again balance balance, balance yeah i definitely yeah. recommend dave so if you were going to want to listen to any uk rappers it'd be him Okay. Fuck yeah, dude. And um, I think because like we've taken quite a bit of time just to kind of like get more familiar with you, talk about your musical background, talk about you becoming a vocalist, talk about how you have, you know, you're kind of um, not even guilty pleasure because you're pretty open about it. You're more like hip hop side. Um, I think the final question I would want to ask for your personal life, and we can take as much time as you need to, um, Basically, I want to learn if there are any major like creative mediums or even like a career that you're pursuing outside of music. That way it's this session being that it's the front man, it's the singer, it's the vocalist. Obviously, you do lyric work for the band as well. Maybe you work with the other boys. Um, But I was wondering if you are doing anything outside of Draconian Rain that you've been like really proud of that you're working hard on. And that kind of diverts you from just being a vocalist and lyricist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, 
it's hard to say because I've got lots of ideas and projects that are in different, you know, stages of of of, of being at the moment. Right. Um, but my main musical output at the moment is Dracoon. Inbound. I'd I'd really like to be a novelist at some point. Ooh, okay, hell yeah. So, uh, I'm an only child, so I spent a lot of time alone as a kid, and um, a lot of that time I'd be writing stories like, dude, fuck imagining yeah. fucking, imagining fucking like, yeah. So I've got lots of story ideas, but it's it, that's really one of those things that when I'm like too old to be fucking screaming on stage, you want to be like, an author. Yeah, I've got, I've definitely got some some creative. I'm always going to want to be creative. Yes. Basically. Yeah. That's the only thing that keeps me going. When I'm at work, fucking, in, I, I'm, I work the most corporate fucking jobs ever. Like, <laughs> you know, I work in an account management and IT, you know, for these big businesses. And the only thing that gets me through the day is daydreaming about cr- being creative. So, you know, Dude, yes. whether, it be, whether it be, yeah, I'm really, I love film as an art form. Um, you know, I'm obsessed with films. Like, I'd love the idea of doing a film podcast. Ooh. Uh, I'm obsessed with basketball, so like, I love the idea of doing a basketball podcast. Like, uh, I listen to podcasts about basketball like every day. I stay up till three in the morning UK time to watch the West Coast games and shit. Like, um, yeah, I've got loads of interests really that I'm like obsessed with. Uh, I don't know how ADHD that is. <laughs> I'm ADHD too, man. I'm with you. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, I get definitely fixate on stuff and like learn everything about it, but. Um, uh, there's I'm, I'm currently doing and uh, i'm writing for fun right now another project uh which is deathcore adjacent um but that it's it's like got the trap metal city morgue style stuff, like stuff. yeah and like 808s and bass uh, uh 808s and like so maybe something drum. similar to scar lord yeah it's hard to say it's it's more I don't want to talk about it too much because you know it's it might not even happen, you know. Right. Um, whereas like Draconian Rain is happening, so I don't want to like do a Draconian Rain episode where I'm like plugging a new band that might yeah, happen. Yeah, exactly. But it, it's more like yeah, like it's not quite Scar Lord, but it's like City Morgue. They're like another sort of trap metal stuff. Yeah. Like rap, but with the metal element and like obviously like Lincoln Park and but mixed with like a case of Strain and the Muir. Dude, and, yes. Like, it's more that sort of thing. Like it's more, it's a bit different, you know, like um, I think it's more from the case of like, you know, I'm, I'm doing an extreme metal band. So I want to do something a bit silly. On yes. the side, you know? Yeah. That yeah. dude, that's completely fine. And I love. Oh, I've lost your audio here. Lost your audio. Okay. We're back. I think. Yeah. yeah, we're back. Okay, cool. <laughs> so it, it's really cool to finally be hosting someone else on the podcast who is planning to be an author because I am actually planning to do a very similar thing um, in the near future. Basically, I'm thinking very similar to a mangaka, which is a manga author anime. Right. Um, awesome. It is. Uh, I'm planning to bounce back and forth between the band and being an author for what will be a six book novel. And it's based loosely in sci fi fantasy. Um, I'm going to have to learn linguistics or linguistics, um, like learn how to speak other languages, which right now is Japanese, um, for a bigger project that I'm planning and reached out to Bone Studios for. And I already have my biggest vocal feature, like interested. So that's like, that's, that's kind of getting kickstarted. Just depends on what the studio says. Cause if they're like, no, then I'm not going to do it. Cause if I did put the album out, um, let's just say it's very similar to Brand of Sacrifices, Lifeblood, um, very similar to Brand of Sacrifices, God, God Hand, in which it's loosely themed off of Berserk. But this one is for something that's going to fit the Black and Deathcore aspect a little bit better. But of course, the two concept albums on their own. We'll have elements of hip hop. They'll have elements of metalcore um, because that's just the formula of the band. But when I'm not doing that, um, the novel that I'm planning to write, I I can drop the name because I don't mind. Um, It's been mostly in the works over a period of time. And I think I'm going to start a Dungeons and Dragons uh, session or campaign for it soon. That way it's more interactive between a small group of people. And I mean, hell, dude, if you wanted to, if you wanted to um, help and like kind of put together a sci-fi fantasy um, novel with me, that would be badass. Um, Open invitation. 
um because it's going to be a dungeons and dragons campaign it's going to start out as that and it's going to uh just slowly build into what it, what will hopefully be a six book novel um i think the major narrative elements in it are really compelling for a lot of people who are um kind of digging into, into conspiracy theories right now um but it's called cryptics it was originally creatures and cryptids but cryptics um it was changed to because like most of the narrative is cryptic like you have to kind of um, dig deeper to find out the secrets and you have to continue reading to find the secrets. So it's a good marketing um, strategy, I believe. Um, and that should be really fun once I finally get started on that bouncing back and forth between the band's major release and then going, just taking a break, especially as we, um, if we ever get big, get into touring, get into monthly touring or even two month yeah. uh, touring runs. It's like after that, okay, want to separate myself from that a little bit and then work on these novels. But dude, I mean, ADHD. Much, What's that? Surprise! How much free time that you'd have on tour, like in that, day. yeah, seriously, yeah, it's, it's so, insane. So, like, if you have a laptop in the, you, you'd be able to get a lot done in the van. Like, you know, that's what and, I realized when we play gigs. Like, there's more, there's more free time that you can fill. Like, if you are touring right. a lot to be if, creative, yeah, if you are not like absolutely exhausted already from like the touring experience and like you know getting gear unpacked and packed and then greeting people and shit that's like the variable variables i definitely try to keep in mind when i have this like massive strategy for bouncing back and forth like a mangaka but yeah i definitely can't wait to get into that and eventually um the plan is as i become more integrated into japanese culture visit japan uh collaborate with japanese musicians all across the board whether they be lisa or whether they be uh, Crystal Lake, Lucretia, which, you know, technically yeah. is a Japanese artist because their guitarist is over in Japan and he's stuck there until further notice because their pandemic uh, regulations and stuff, their rules and regulations for uh, nationwide or international travel is still pretty strict, rightfully so. Um, yeah, it's, it's it, I can't wait to um, have the financial resources and the um, the time, the applications to go ahead and get into that process. It, it's going to be a massive thing. And um, amongst other things, I think it will definitely be that crack the world open uh, endeavor that I've been dragon chasing per se since I was very, yeah. very young. It's just bouncing back and forth between writing a major sci-fi novel that could eventually become an anime if I sell it to the right studio. And if I'm comfortable with that, that can make good money. Um, and then I'm also like, I've always been into uh, being an artist, a graphic artist. So I eventually want to uh, tattoo myself, you know, and get an apprentice uh, apprenticeship and just like kind of do pieces for myself, do pieces for other people. Maybe that can be a side gig. Um, it all just depends on how this timeline pursues um, as time and space continues, as as we're doing right now, really, second by second. But um, I think that would be a good way to wrap up what is the first half of the session. And I mean, I definitely know we plan to uh, only do this for like maybe an hour or two. So I will be as um i'll be as quick and as efficient as possible in this next half um but yeah welcome to part two everybody <laughs> um and it's currently probably like what's 805 or like 820 something for you right now uh something like that yes 805 exactly here yeah cool badass i'm kind of getting better with time <laughs> skipping and all that but um, as we kind of descend into the second half with the what I can only assume to be one of the main guys who started the project in session, um, definitely want to now jump into a mindset like imagine I'm a dude approaching you at a show and I'm asking you these kind of like basic even like borderline keem star interview questions. It's like kind of checklist questions. Sure. Um, starting off, how did you come up with the name for the band Draconian Rain? Oh, great question. Um, I think I was watching the news. Um, so uh, I can't remember what the subject was. I don't want to get too political. I think it was relating to, um, this was 2019. I think it was relating to um, Hong Kong wanting its independence. Okay. Um, from China. And the word draconian was used. Um, so the word comes from the Roman lawmaker Draco, uh, who um, introduced really harsh penalties for people who broke the law. Uh, so the word draconian was, um, you know, a really unfair or brutal 
um, regime, essentially. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, that word's fucking obviously mad as fuck. Um, and then I was like, okay, so you'd have a draconian rule or a draconian reign. And then I was like, I just fucking went on Instagram and tapped in draconian reign. Wasn't taken. That was it. Badass, dude. That's that's actually and very similar to bands like Nine Dead. Um, that's actually the only one I could really compare to that explanation because they ended up getting their name off of a um, I think it was an article having to do with a music festival where, well, nine people were found dead, but I cannot confirm that. So yeah, it's it's been quite a bit of time as that session was conducted last October. So it's definitely been a bit of time since that happened, but that's that's really cool that you ended up utilizing a real world event and a comparison. And I mean, shit, I had no idea that Hong Kong was ever trying to claim independence from uh, the rest of China. That's actually really interesting. Um, yeah. And like you have countries like Taiwan and stuff, which well, apparently to China, that's big. That's bad news that they're trying to continue to claim independence. So that's actually really cool. Um, I absolutely when I first heard the name, when I first saw the logo and everything, especially the newer one with the gates, um, so I think it's quite common that people kind of parallel the two words Draco and like dragon, right? So yeah. I was like, well, does Dracula. it have something to do? With, does it have something to do with dragons? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> I actually want to preface that the Hong Kong thing. Uh, actually, it was so Hong Kong was ruled by the British, I think, and then Hong Kong was given its independence. So Hong Kong. I'm not sure how what's happening now. This was a few months ago. Hong Kong was independent, and then China wanted to make it part of China again. So I think it wanted to retain its independence rather than get it back. Right, right. Just to, just to throw that out there, but yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's not dragons. Yeah. So I've had people who are like, is it something to do dragons or is it to do Dracula? No, but the reason it sounds like that is why it sounds so fucking cool. So you know, the reason we chose it was because it could be like that. It's just, right. It's, the potential, yeah, and that it, yeah. it also kind of works with the uh, the musical subgenre that you guys are pursuing. Obviously, I'm gonna have to listen to Necromantic, um, and that like gorgeous uh, horizontal um logo that you guys had, which I hope to see on some future merch. I think that would be super sick. Um, yeah, we'll bring it back. We'll bring it back. Fuck yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, like I, it's it's really funny how much I obsess with the details of band merch too. Um, and of course, I'll get to that back to that in a second. But no, that's awesome. It's an awesome explanation. Yeah, me too. So the reason we got the new logo was because we wanted it to be more legible. Um, so, you know, we were on lots of posters and then they'd have to put a fucking name underneath. <laughs> it's like, no, fuck that. We just want a logo that's still very metal and gothic and within that dark aesthetic, but also yeah. readable to, you know, someone who might not be into extreme metal. They might just be into yeah, um, you know, alternative music in general might see the poster and be able to read it yeah well and still that, yeah spiky feel exactly and that makes sense because i think it's actually pretty cool aesthetic um i guess going back to merch because this works really well um i've seen plenty of bands who like on the band tours or like band uh posters concert posters um they'll have like they're very quite illegible for even most uh metalhead enthusiasts um they'll have the logo and then they'll have like the the old english font or whatever right below it I think that actually works really well for uh, for merch. Um, and I definitely plan to do that in the future with uh, Blind With Utter Failures merch because our, our current logo is pretty legible. So I definitely want to slam the fuck out of that. Yeah, and um, spiky. Spiky, yeah, baby. yeah, real spiky. It's either spiky, drippy, or it just looks like a living. It looks like living tissue. And yeah. that's like the fun thing about um, getting into like death metal logos, death core logos, any of that shit. Most of it ends up being old English and like slightly warped, slightly, you know, like sunken in or whatever and i'm like nah dude get away from the old english like just start doing chicken scratch shit again <laughs> like that well, we've, we've done both now so yeah exactly exactly yeah. um no I, I love that shit and i definitely have every intention in the future to become like a logo artist and stuff i've done like a couple pieces now but i need to add more like fan logos to the portfolio to like bring more people in but i just never have the time it sucks um so, steve crow uh, who did our logo uh, for Draconian Rain. He's the uh, guitarist from a really epic brutal death metal band called Condemned. Okay. Uh, they also shared uh, members with Disgorge. I think he's done the, the the logos for pretty much all the really 
um, great modern brutal death metal bands, including yeah. Distant Tomb and stuff like that. So he was oh. awesome. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's a cool little thing to know. And I think they yeah. actually just signed to Unique Leader Records, which is fucking sick. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I, dude, I love logos. I love logos, like, probably more than most people, and that's why I should definitely become a logo designer. But anyways. Check, check, check out Steve Perry. Check out his stuff. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, um, we got that question answered. We got Draconian Reigns band name origin um, supplemented to um, you folks. So, you're welcome. Um, next question, I think, would be concerning Draconian Reign and stuff. What is like the most important thing to you when it comes to writing lyrics, doing vocals, or just structure, um, like getting the structure in there for a draconian rain song? Um, it needs to match the general vibe of the song. So, uh -huh. you know, yeah, we made a concerted effort to um, write sort of sad songs, sad ish sounding songs on the CP. Um, especially the song The Funeral, which is the last song of the EP. Um, I wanted the songs to have the sort of, uh, really have that sort of English Gothic horror, you know, vibe, you know. When I say English, I mean actual, you know, writers like Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley, you know, the the sort of godfathers and godmothers of, of horror sort of came from, from that Victorian... British writing era. So um, Trevor Stoner from Black Dolly Murder, I know I keep saying his name, he really inspired me the way he wrote. Just wanted to write with a sort of gothic horror vibe that really is very British, you know? Um, so yeah, we, we, it was just that sort of vibe. I wanted it to be dark. I wanted it to sort of conjure the image of like graveyards and sort of the epic ideas of like, eternal love and loss and like the afterlife and gravestones and cathedrals and all that fucking shit yeah which yeah. i think it did i think the tragedy eternal so far being that that's the only ep i've listened to i think yeah. that i think it captures that really well it's got that spooky vibe to it it's got that gothic vibe you know the fry vocals from like the black metal era and stuff like that the really prominent black metal era it really shows through and I yeah. hear when, when I was listening to Tragedy Eternal, um, just like providing that first impression before even the front to back session is released. Um, I was definitely hearing a lot of like A Night in the Abyss, but I was also hearing the Black Dahlia Murder. I was hearing um, Behemoth in there a little bit, too. And then I thought of my own buddies from over here in the States, uh, that being Slaughter the False Prophet. I was hearing a little bit of Warm Shepherd in there. Um, so, again, that's that's why I was like Black and Deathcore. <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I think we're definitely much more inspired by the older bands and like the older, you know, we don't have loads of crazy tempo changes or loads of really crazy breakdowns. So no. we're much more conservative in our songwriting. Like we restructure things like a pop song. We write songs like Cradle of Filth and, and Dimmu do. Like, yeah, we, we're sort of like the gothic metal through the lens of Deathcore. You know, we, we we don't like play a breakdown, then drop it 20 BPM and, you know, like that sort of thing. Well, actually we do it once on EP, but like, <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we, you know, I don't think we're like the standard deathcore band in that we write deathcore songs. We just happen to be a deathcore band that's really into that sort of imagery and shit. So like a lot of those bands you mentioned, I haven't listened to. So I think Worm Shepherd are really cool. Uh, but it's not a band that I repeat listen to just yeah. simply because they are in the same vein as us. And that's right. if I wasn't in this band, I'd probably listen to Worm Shepherd all the fucking time. So I think this is fucking <laughs> yeah. sick. Right. But, you know, I try and stay away from bands that are of the, that of the have same, the same genre. elements as us. Yeah, know? exactly. The elements being high, the, you know, down tuned tremolo picking and blast beats and orchestral sections and high screams and yes. dark you know, dark song subjects. Exactly. They have the same elements as us, so I tend to avoid listening to it in case, you know, as you said, because um, you can end up, you know, writing the same shit as everyone else. Exactly. And that would that would never be fun because then you'd have people in the comments like, oh, you copied Worm Shepherd. It's like, we didn't want to um, yeah. <laughs> that, that would Yeah, yeah we didn't copy Lorna Shaw. We just copied the same bands as Lorna Shaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, it's awesome. 
Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it just means that you guys are contributing in your unintentionally, which is even better, participating in one of the biggest booming subgenres in metal uh, in mm -hmm. recent recent years. And I would argue like that really started in 2019 with bands like Enterprise Earth, uh, Shadow of Intent, Shrine of Malice. Like that year was fucking huge for Black and Death Deathcore slash Death Metal. Like there were so many iconic bands and albums that came out in that year. And um, per the name for my what will be my chapter 19 uh, top 10 of 2019, even though there are like 20 albums that came out that year that I just fucking repeat to this day. Um, like definitely those bands, they they really help solidify. Yeah, this is sticking around for a long time. Like, yeah. let's let's bring it on. And then Immortal Lorna Shores Immortal came out like December of that same year, really. Technically, it was 2021 or like it was technically a 2020 album or people you know really digested it in 2020 but it was definitely um a 2019 record and therefore that's four that's four yeah. that freaking albums just iconic records that I all started in 2018 as well it's like this is how was like their um comeback single with cj and that came out in 2018 right right no so you're like, absolutely they, right yeah so like there was definitely a long build-up period to the album. So yeah, yeah that's when I felt like the genres really pick up steam. You right. know, it really started in 20 fucking 14 when Carnifex brought out Die Without Hope. And that's a funny thing too. Like Carnifex is the only prominent band, one of the top dogs of that subgenre, whether because of their visual aesthetics or how they write their music. I have not listened to that many Carnifex records. I don't know why. Like, I've never had an interest to listen to them. But... So, before they were very much a MySpace deathcore band and that they followed the same, as, as I said, they have the same um, elements as bands like Suicide Silence, you know? Yeah. And then um, they had the Mosh Riffs and stuff. And then I think they had a hiatus, maybe. Then when they came back with Die Without Hope, they had a slightly different lineup and it was more, they had symphonic elements. It was much more tremolo and blast beat based. It had the sort of melodic death metal. Right elements more ma mature somewhere out, i'd say and then uh i think it was 2017 or was it 2016 um they brought out fucking hell the album's escaping my name uh the, the album name's escaping me um but that was like the first quote-unquote black and death crowd in my opinion obviously you had bands like winds of plague and the breathing process back right in 2008 2009 2007 right but that was symphonic but much more grandiose rather than dark, you know. Right, exactly. And it had a, it a bit, I suppose Breathing Process were kind of black metal inspired, but like Winds of Plague was much more sort of tongue in cheek because they had the sort of uh, beat down, the, not beat down, they had the sort of hardcore elements as well. So it was much less like taking itself seriously. Yes, exactly. And shout out to the Breathing Process as well because they're good friends of ours now. Yeah, and, they're um, like one of the Breathing Process are one of the fucking OGs, man. But like Carnifex in like 2017, 2016 um the song dark heart ceremony um which is the first song of the album the fucking name i've forgotten Fuck, what's it called we could just google it yeah but yeah <laughs> then, um, that was like the first quote unquote black and death call which is a term i don't particularly enjoy using simply because i don't think there's much black metal in it oh I think, yeah i think there's a lot of symphonic black metal in it yes um yeah and the sort of maybe the quote unquote mainstream symphonic black metal involved, and then other than that, it's the high, um, the high note tremolo riffs over blast beats, which actually, you know, bands like Black Dahlia Murder were doing before. Yeah, no exactly. So that's why I don't really use the term, just because you know there's so much more to the black metal than blast beats and strings. Dude, I agree. And if you if you want a recommendation i think this will be my only one during session really and i don't usually do this but um if you're looking for something that's bleak if you're looking for something that's more strictly black metal definitely check out uh solder the false prophet and their first ep desecration he um alex maleficus lopez the vocalist um he definitely labels the band as bleak deathcore so it yeah. utilizes all of the more like just darker bleak aspects of black metal, but it also has plenty of like warm shepherd inspiration in there. Um, so I definitely recommend the desecration EP um, just so because of how, them. yeah, it, it's, it's going to be. Um, uh, for any, I, for what's any up? black metal recommendations as well. Um, okay. There's a much more mid tempo sort of depressive suicidal black metal band called non N O N E. They're fucking bleak as shit. 
Um, so they're a bit like Shining, the Swedish band. Um, then there's a band called Woods of Desolation. They're really, they're like DSBM, but they're really beautiful. Um, and then there's a band called Spectral Wound. Um, they are Canadian, I believe. And they're much more early 2000s, Gorgoroth, second wave of Norwegian black Ooh. metal. Okay. And they're very riffy and hooky. They're actually playing Nottingham next Friday. So I'm going to see them next week. They're, oh, yeah. They're, Come into the UK. Yeah, so Spectral Wound um, and N-O-N-E, Non, and Woods Desolation. If you're into your black male and you're listening, like, then yeah. you probably But they're fucking cool. Yeah. Sick. Yeah, I'll definitely keep that in mind. And again, I guess I'll have uh, plenty of uh, DM notifications after this podcast session or like sometime tomorrow, just like blink, yeah. blink, blink, blink. But <laughs> yeah. I honestly prefer it that way, honestly, because that means that we have so much music to listen to and i'm gonna have so many albums to listen to so many eps that i'm gonna have to wake up like every morning at like 4 a.m for like the next two weeks and listen to like three different albums in one go but as we kind of continue and we're learning more about draconian rain after what is a large plethora of music recommendations which i encourage that honestly and for all future podcast uh participants per se Um, definitely bring like all of your albums on the table. I know there are plenty who have done that before, but like how much we've got in the session is crazy. Like I'll have more than enough to more than enough to eat more than enough to listen to per se. Um, so I think right now would be a good time to go ahead and go under the skin track by track lyrical analysis for tragedy eternal. Of course, I have every intention to do, um, a necromantic, under the skin under the skin session later in time after i've listened to the ep that way i kind of understand at least the uh the music side of what's going on but let's go ahead and go under the skin of tragedy eternal real quick starting with um i think it's geez the darkness below the darkness below okay so what do we got going on lyrically here man um god so the darkness below is kind of like a song about suicide um, but it's sort of like a thematic song of sort of just letting go. And the song itself is about walking into a lake and just sort of drowning. Oh, damn. Uh, so um, the 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 point of view of the song is someone who is sort of daydreaming through the woods, walking to the lake, and they've sort of accepted uh, the end and, you know, they're ready they're ready just to let go and the water's really cold and if you've got the lyrics up um let's see i think they should be on genius or they should be on our spotify or yes okay it starts with the earring and by a thread correct by what sorry uh the let's see the darkness below the lyrics start with uh you're hanging by a thread correct no okay oh you know what i think it's because i'm still over on the <laughs> veil of maya from earlier Okay, so now, okay, on Spotify, it doesn't seem that you have the lyrics available. So I guess we'll go ahead and go to Genius real quick. That's fine. Um, Draconian Rain. I should have had this pulled up while you were talking, but you know. Oh, no, do not worry. That's all. <laughs> See the darkness below. Lyrics. Licorice. Uh, you got Music Match, I think. Okay, no. Um, I don't think I'm finding it right now because I, I typed up everything, but it doesn't seem to be available. Worry, so we'll just go so, off the quote. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so the the person whose point of view it is they walk into the lake, they sort of daydream into the lake, and they're being, you know, pulled below by the cold of of the lake. It sort of pierces them and drags them down. And then the chorus. Um, the choruses that just then sort of fall into the bottom of the lake. Uh, so it goes through the shadows I fall uh, to the numbness, to the numbness I long for. With my final breath, I shall save at the end, never to be found, never to be found again. That's the lyric. So they're all quite dark songs, really. Um, but that's generally what that song's about. So sort of killing yourself by drowning. <laughs> Right. I've also yeah. got my cat here. Oh, cat. We're having a cat on podcast. Let's go. <gasps> Kitty. It's a black cat, too. Let's go. Let's go. What's her She's name? Not very ha- She's not very happy with me, so I'm going to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> 
So track two would be Before the Gates. What's going on here? So Before the Gates is a sort of um, a story of two lovers who've been sort of divided by death. So one of them has passed away. The other one is sort of still sort of lingering around, sort of waiting for their own death. Um, so they're, they're walking the graveyard, waiting for their own death so that they can be reunited. And it's really just about their sadness um, and how they're basically waiting at the gates of death so that they can be reunited, but also, you know, waiting at the gates of the graveyard. It's them being in the graveyard on their own, hearing the crows above and and sort of just the tragedy and sadness of it all, really, yeah. Yeah, the tragedy eternal that comes with separation between life and death, which it's interesting because there is a popular, very, very popular song um, by an artist called Yosabi. It's, um, it's a Japanese pop song. Um, I forgot how let's see yosabi right okay yosabi yosobi um despite my learning of japanese right now uh i cannot translate or pronunciate the name so good on me for participating in duolingo but not be able to fucking um pronounce pr pronounce that um very similar thing uh it's very strange lyrically speaking and it talks about um this woman who is suicidal and she actually f is falling in love with death. So she continues to attempt per se. Um, and it's a very, very strange song, but it it's funny because the meme behind it is like, it it's very catchy. It's very poppy. It sounds bright as hell, but the lyrical content is some of the most dismal shit you've ever heard of in Japanese pop song. So um, yeah. definitely wanted to. Those, those themes are just fucking everlasting. Like it's just epic, like, you know, love and death, something everyone is going to feel. And sort of those, sort of themes of love and death being intertwined again it themes in it goes in with like the sort of british gothic horror themes of you know dracula and frankenstein right the, you know frankenstein's bride and you know all, all the sorry the monster's bride um all that <clears> stuff <throat> it all, all all was the same sort of victorian era literature that you know in england definitely we sort of studied that shit as kids obviously we learned a lot about Shakespeare like you guys learn about the presence and shit we learn about like Shakespeare and, yeah and British writers um so you know that's something that like was quite instilled in me as a kid so it's sort of those epic themes that you know great epic fantasies are built on the same shit like that's really what inspired me to write that song and, and the um the the album cover the EP cover is sort of the same thing like it's sort of right like a sort of yeah. tragic forbidden love between death and and someone who's living no that's, that's actually really cool i never like i don't know how i didn't piece that together that's pretty easy to piece together but you know now we have it confirmed um yeah. track three would be infernal requiem yeah so this one's just like a stupid death call song <laughs> no this one's like yeah it's just about someone who's very like they just want to watch the world burn to quote fucking dark night like uh it, it's just a, a sort of love letter to fire like fire is fucking epic like everyone thinks fire is cool as shit yeah it's just a song about everything burning and everything being temporary and you know fire is a fucking powerful element that erases things yeah it, it can just erase you like you would never have been there you know and if you really like dig into it too like fire is a great connection to that love and death thing yeah because fire can be like the fire burning in your soul but also fire brings death it brings life yeah um it's like one of the major elements that can indeed provide duality in the world like ice you can be ice cold but you can also be relaxed and cold but the thing is I would argue, though we have on Earth, on planet Earth, I guess for any extraterrestrials who might fucking listen to this podcast, that, that's a stupid joke. Um, <laughs> uh, like, none of the other elements, I would argue, bring as much life and death as fire does. So, I mean, oh, it also definitely. correlates like, with other... We wouldn't be able to live without it. Exactly. Caveman shit. But also, yeah. like, um, you know, it's it's got the sort of love story subtext to it as well like 
you know, this person wants everything to burn, but he wants to burn as well. But he also is asking someone else to join him. And he's sort of saying, look, this world isn't permanent in this life. Like, we're just going to wilt and suffer. That's yeah. Some of the so, like, just join me in death. Like, exactly. So it's, it's another song, like, from the point of view of someone asking someone to join them in death. All the songs are generally about suicide or death or loss or love. Like, in the name of love. love. Yeah. yeah. Like, this sort of the theme of the whole thing is like, you know, you, again, with, like, going back to fucking Shakespeare and classic theatre. Like, it all comes from, you know, comedies and tragedies. Like, a tragedy is is a classic form of storytelling. So right. that's that's basically what I went for with this. Fantastic. And track four, the final track would be The Funeral. You said this was meant to be more of like a sad, slower one. It definitely is, you know, utilizing that fire analogy and those fire-themed uh, elements. It's definitely a slow burn, and that's the first thing when I that I thought when I was listening to this earlier today is that compared to the rest of the album, it is an outro track for sure. Yeah. And like there's no doubt about that, but it also is a slow burn. So what's going on here? So musically, this was much more inspired by you know the sort of late noughties, um, symphonic black metal like Dark Fortress and the early Abigail Williams stuff. So we wanted to make, you know, uh, an effort to actually like sonically sound much more quote unquote black metal outside deathcore. Um, it starts with a sort of piano, um, sort of piano intro. Um, so Infernal Requiem actually has a part in the chorus where it is almost like a requiem at a funeral, you know, a eulogy where it's saying, okay, we're gathered here today to say goodbye. And then the last song is, is more about a funeral um, not as such about, you know, the act of funeral people going, you know, gathering or anything like that, like the previous song. Um, but, you know, we've all had people that we've lost at the time of writing. This song is about someone who loses someone's suicide. Um, so the intro of the song um, deals with uh, someone's loved one or friend. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't specify um, being lost to suicide and being there Um at that moment and then like them reminiscing on the night of of when it happened and right and then them dealing with the loss and them still having dreams about it and um yeah still not being able to let go of that the um, morning process yeah it's just the morning process it's much less like you know quote unquote metal you know this is much more of a personal song uh and yeah, I think like we've actually had a few DMs of people who've, who've really connected with the lyrics, which is really nice. Like, Good. Yeah, so it's it's much it's much more personal song, and you know it's it's more of a sad song, I guess. But we wanted yeah. to write something a bit different, sort of end EP. Yeah, and after all, like you have to have something that sticks out in the album, and that's what I love is when bands and artists, you know, they're prominently a metalcore band, they're prominently a death metal band or a deathcore band, whatever. Yeah, and it's always great when they have like softer, just strictly instrument, instrumental interludes, or for example, the intro, the outro, and then you have your interludes. Um, one band specifically that I would name that has done that with every single album they've ever done would be Silent Planet. My favorite band of all time. Um, really good people too. Uh, they've been through a lot and they are preparing to gear up for their next album cycle, which I'm so excited about. Because there's a lot of like conspiracy theory elements and just like stuff that was going on during the writing process and um, continuing from their last record back in 2021, Iridescent, um, that really just make it more of like a raw and kind of panicked album. But also it's like hard on your sleeve, um, everything on your sleeve, just out in the open, no more secrets, that type of thing. And that's why I love um, musically about them is that they either do research projects for their music or they will just pluck um, and they will be provided stories by all their fans, lovers. That's what they call their fans, which is also really cool. Um, like they do a whole bunch of different shit. But with this next album, I'm, I'm really excited for the more like extraterrestrial conspiracy theory element that they plan to incorporate into the album, along with it being, I'm pretty sure it'll be like hella more genty, um, hella more heavy than any of their previous material. So that should also be fun. Um but kind of going back to Draconian Rain, because that's what we're talking about in session. Um, very, very awesome. And um, I think the only question I would have left 
which more or less you've explained on multiple occasions whilst talking about these four tracks, is how you decided upon the EP name for Tragedy Eternal. Obviously, we don't have a title track, but that is the title of the EP. Yeah. So do you have like any other, did you have any other commentary that you wanted to provide as far as why you decided um, Tragedy Eternal to be the title? I think what we really wanted to do with this was to fucking write what if my chemical romance wrote a fucking symphonic deathcore ep you know we wanted it to be sad we wanted it to be dramatic like if you look at the fucking ep cover it looks like my, a deathcore version of a my chemical romance ep you know, of three cheers for sweet revenge you know like james and i like really love that band uh and we love how dramatic they are with the themes of like death and love and shit so we just took so, like you know very loose inspiration from that and we just wanted it to be as sad as possible like we just wanted that sort of quote-unquote emo fucking vibe you know that's not really music that you know i listen to particularly i really like the the flair for the dramatic and the personal connections that you can get with sad songs yeah so it was more just like okay we want it to be sad we've written a few songs the word tragedy was cool the word eternal is cool. So it was going to be called Eternal Tragedy. And then I was like, oh no, Tragedy Eternal. Which is really fucking funny because like a month before our EP came out, She Must Burn brought out a song called Misery Eternal. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> we're just going to have to bring it out anyway because we'd already got the merch printed and all that shit. Exactly. Uh, and then Nothing Nowhere, um, he brought out an album called like Void Eternal or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like this all came out like i think his came out just after ours or just before so but luckily like they hadn't used the word tragedy and it was more just like it just sounded epic it sounded sad it had that sort of gothic vibe to it um that's just what we wanted to portray yeah from these songs from these stories so it it came to me whilst i was fucking going to the shop to buy some bread <laughs> and i was like oh tragedy so i text james like oh yeah what do you think of this name and he was like yeah that's cool right that is, is that yeah. No, fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. And at the very least, like no, no jab to previous uh pod like podcast attendees or previous artists that we've had. But like it's always great to at least hear even kind of like something more funny of a story behind how yeah. the name was decided. You're like, oh yeah, I was just going to get bread. And I'm like, tragedy eternal. That's it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's better than we just thought it was cool. Like we just thought it sounded cool. Like yeah. yeah. Over time, I'm like, I wish there was more to it than that. But anyways um so that was tragedy eternal that was the end of the skin session so future me boop and with that we are very much near the end of our podcast session now basically all i'll be inquiring upon is any future plans uh over this next the rest of this year really because we only have six months left in 2023 fantastic year so far um so what what future plans do you guys have that you're able to disclose and able to discuss at this moment? Well, we're going to be writing the album. That's the first thing. So we'll have a debut album out fairly soon. Uh, so that's the big one. So everything that people might like about it is going to be bigger, better. You know, we're going to have more money for production, value for videos and, you know, mix and stuff. Um, so everything that we jumped from Necro, we're going to have another jump, hopefully. Um, we're playing UK Tech first. Uh, which is a festival in Nottinghamshire, our local county. And I mean, the band's playing that. It's like uh, Chelsea Green, Kublai Khan, Aborted, Born of Osiris, you know. Um, then we're playing Fall in the Brawl in Manchester. So, sorry, um, I got to pause real quick. I'll be right back. So, all right. So you mentioned a festival. Um, what else do you guys got going on? Uh, we're playing another festival called Mangata Festival. That's in Nottingham, our hometown. Um with some really great, all, all the great bands, the local metal bands. Um, then we're playing uh, Fall in the Brawl in Manchester. Those were some really heavy bands like Archangel and Acranius and bands like okay. that. Um, and then, shit, I should know this. Then we're looking to go on tour in November, but we haven't penciled it in yet. So that's a maybe. Okay. So. I might even say that. All right, let's start again. And then we <laughs> might be going on tour at another point later in the year. Um, it's all just an idea at the moment, but, you know, we're, we're pushing some stuff out. And then a few more shows in the pipeline that we haven't announced yet. Um, so, yeah, hopefully some more 
good stuff. We just want to play more shows, get out there. We've just actually just got up tour. Uh, we played a little um, little run last month, which was really fucking good. We sold out two of the shows. That was fucking awesome. Um, yeah. So, yeah, things are going really good, man. And, Fantastic, yeah, dude. There'll be more awesome. music soon. More, more music soon, people. Pay attention to that. Yeah. And <laughs> like, dude, that's the thing, too, with bands like, what I've learned is that behind the scenes, no matter what, as soon as they've gotten new material out, they're already starting on the new material, which I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. But also it makes sense because yeah. it's like, you got to stay on that consistent grind. Otherwise, you know, you're basically a room full of people on the couch looking at your phones. Like, what do you want to do? You know, like the fucking birds from jungle yeah. book. Right. He's like, what do you want to do? Yeah. I don't know what you want to do. Oh, don't start with that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like, hundred percent. Like, like you just got to strike while the iron, iron is hot, man. Like, there are fucking thousands of bands. So you, everyone's got to be the hardest working one. Like you got, you got to bring up, you got to play more shows than everyone else. You got to bring out more fucking music. Like that's the only thing. Like you know, we, we're a tiny band. Like everything's going quite well considering how new we are. And we played Bloodstock. That was cool to like, you know, a couple thousand people. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we're a fucking nobody yet. You know, like you just got to keep hammering. Like keep hammering, man. How, like there are fucking tens of thousands of, of metal bands that are all fucking good enough to be, you know, the next band. Yeah. So, you know, only a hundred of them are going to fucking grind. Yeah, exactly. Well, that I think is a great way to end. I don't even know what fucking episode number this is going to be because we have, I think three That's or four. One. Yeah. <laughs> the next one. Exactly. <laughs> um, Cause we have plenty of podcast episodes in storage right now. And really we're just looking to get the podcast intros from the other vocalist. And if not, then basically I'll improvise something that allows both uh, me and the other vocalist to collaborate. And I've done that before, so we'll get it figured out. We'll be getting episodes, more episodes to you guys here um, soon. Next band I think we'll be hosting is Heirs of Humanity, which is an Eastern United States uh, slamming deathcore band. But I would argue that they're kind nice. of like, yeah, they should. That lost you, lost you, Mike. I hate Let's what... start from Heirs of Humanity. Yes, Heirs of Humanity. We got um airs of humanity we got surefire which um i'm excited to host them because they're i don't know if you're familiar with spite um but they kind of mix like that harder spite death core with like metal core so yeah, that's, that's really cool. yeah really good combination and then um we'll be hosting of the betrayer cali based for sure black and death core they just got their new ep uh your dark your your darkness will save you um out independently through slam worldwide yeah really good name um, and I'm excited for the near future as we kind of get back on the grind and try to get as many podcast episodes out to you guys as possible, including the ones again that we have in storage. But thank you again, James, for your time here on the Anatomy Crosscast, whatever episode number it ends up being. And I hope to host the entirety or the other members of Draconian Reign in the future. As you we know what talk to those guys, they're fucking boring. Right. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. I'm playing, I'm playing. Right, right. <laughs> Sorry, guys, love you. <laughs> He's like, what the fuck, James? Um <laughs> But yeah, we'll definitely be back. We'll have them back on the podcast um once they are closer to unveiling or releasing their full um their full length record in the future. Um and yeah, until next time, guys, keep on the grind, just like the great eternal music machine. Let's keep cranking and we'll see you guys later.